Well, today we are going to be concluding our summer Bible gym study, and I hope that this, this serves to remind us of what we've been learning about throughout the summer, as well as allow this to, to continue beyond uh, just, you know, something that exists for us June through August, but really uh, would characterize our, our practice throughout the year. And this morning, I want to raise the question, how do we experience change as Christians? How, over time, do we become more like God has made us to be and less the way that sin has corrupted us to be? And specifically, coming out of our summer Bible jam, how does God use his word to do that in us? You know, I, don't know about, I don't know about you, but, but there are things about me that I want to see changed. And they're just familiar, sinful responses that surface in me again and again. If you have any self-awareness, there, there, there comes a point when you realize that you really are the main problem in your life, right? It really is just you, and, and you're grieved with the ways that your sin hurts the people around you. But, but we need to be careful because we can want change for the wrong reasons. We just want life to be easier, or we're, we're tired of discouragement, and we want to feel better about ourselves, or maybe we want to see certain relationships put back together and we figure out if I, if I could just learn to do something differently, then maybe this person will forgive me. And, and, and the problem with, with those motives is that they won't lead to lasting transformation. And that's because, for one thing, they have nothing to do with God. Uh, but, but they also stem from a superficial understanding of our issues. In order to experience genuine change, we, we need to understand not only what we do, but why we do these things. And so you find yourself reacting with frustration or impatience. Why? What's going on inside of you? What are you after? Or, or why does it make you so angry when you're misunderstood? Or when you're unappreciated? Or why do you get shut down and turn inward and retreat when people criticize you? Or why has life felt so deflated lately? It feels joyless. You're always comparing yourself with others and feeling like you were dealt a poor hand. Right? Do you have an awareness, not just that you do these things, but why you do them? Because scripture provides for us a diagnosis. It, it, it locates the condition in our hearts. We, we have a heart problem. You know, our hearts, according to Hebrews 4.12, have things like thoughts and intentions. And, and they make themselves known. There, there are desires and ambitions and cravings that we live out of. There are certain things that we want. And when we don't get them, it isn't pretty. And so ambition to be seen as successful drives your fear of things not coming together. And that leads you to be impatient with, with the people in your life that are competing for your time and for your attention. You begin to see them as problems because they're complicating things. They're, 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 they're threatening what you believe is going to promote you as significant and successful. And that's where some of those conflicts come from and some of those reactions. Or you desire a sense of security. And so you rack your mind with anxiety in search of anything that might provide some sense of assurance that things are going to turn out all right. And, and your conversations with others basically consist of you making an argument as to why everything in your life is about to fall apart. And, and they've become used to hearing the, the Eeyore script and they just kind of filter that through. Oh, that's just so-and-so being themselves again. Well, why is that you? Do we just treat that as normal? Right? We, we, you've begun to see the very things that God has called you to do as threatening and you want to escape. Why? Well, because you haven't gotten what you want and it's made you desperate. Or you have this driving need to be respected. You know, you, you usually seem like a level-headed person. But when just the right buttons are pushed in you, you can erupt with the most sharp and hateful words. Maybe you've even laid your hands on the people that you love. What's going on there? 
You need to understand that, that that's more than just an anger problem. It, but it is that, but you haven't paid attention to the craving that has controlled you. All right, so here's the question. What, what fixes this in us? How can we change? A couple hundred years ago, a pastor named Thomas Chalmers preached a sermon titled The Expulsive Power of a New Affection. And he said it's not enough to just focus on reforming your behavior or even to be told that you're, you're making a wreck of your life. Th those kinds of warnings in and of themselves are not enough. Th there are many people who see pretty clearly that, that what they're doing is wrong, but it, it doesn't have any sort of lasting effect or real difference. So Chalmers says, the only way to dispossess the heart of an old affection is by the expulsive power of a new one. And an expulsive meaning that it expels or it, it drives out something else. Uh, the image that came to mind for me is a, is a syringe pump. You know, use that for like uh, children's and, and baby Tylenol, which for some reason we, we make use of a lot in my home. It just seems to always be required. And you know, for, for baby Tylenol, it comes with that little syringe and you, you stick it in there and, and, and it's an airtight thing. It's got a little vacuum in it so that when you draw it, it, it pulls in the medicine into the tube. And then you push on the pump in the back and that pressure then drives it back out. And typically that means I, I've squirted medicine all over Leo's clothes. Um, that's just what happens. And, and, and in a similar way, what Chalmers is saying is that new affections drive out old impulses that have occupied the vacuum of our hearts. And this means that, that something has to be to us more compelling more desirable, more rewarding than the false comforts and empty pleasures that so often captivate our hearts. Now, what does that have to do with our summer Bible jam? Well, because what we've been studying and practicing this summer, a careful reading and meditating on scripture, is how you get new affections. God has given us his Bible so that as we, and we seek to encounter him through it, over time we are changed. And the longest chapter in the Bible is a celebration of how this works. So if you turn with me to Psalm 119. Psalm 119, each week we have introduced a different genre of scripture. We've begun this series in the Psalms and that's how we're gonna conclude our time together. And we've mentioned how the Psalms, that they're written in Hebrew poetry. And Hebrew poetry, it doesn't have some of the normal things like the roses are red, violets are blue type stuff that we might be used to in, in our poems. It doesn't have uh, rhyme or meter, but there are other things in there that help you see that, that it's written in poetry. And one of the things that, that stands out about Psalm 119 is, is not just its, its size. I mean, it's the, the, the longest chapter in, in the Bible, but, but how it's structured, right? If you, if you look down on your pages there, you, you might see in your Bible that there are these little different sections there and they have these headings of Aleph and Beit and Gimel and, and Dalet and, and those are letters in the Hebrew alphabet and the reason why the, the, the publisher put that there is to help you see that uh, in that little section, in that, that first one, Aleph, uh, every line in that section begins with that letter. Right, so this is written out as an as extensive acrostic. And each, each section has eight verses and there are 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet which gives you 176 verses. And, and, and that's intentional, right? It, it's, it's drawing your attention to this. It's saying... Pay attention to these words. Think about them. Remember them. Maybe even memorize them. Maybe that's why it's a memory aid that it's structured like this. But this psalm is basically an extended argument for what we've sought to do this summer. And it wants us to see all of life included in this. Like from A to Z or from Aleph to Tav, it sees the good life as delighting in God through his word. And, and we're just gonna, we're not gonna read this whole thing uh, this morning. We're gonna zoom in on one of the sections here. So let's read together, starting in verse nine. The psalmist writes, how can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. With my whole heart, I seek you. 
Let me not wander from your commandments. I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. With my lips, I declare all the rules of your mouth. In the way of your testimonies, I delight as much as in all riches. I will meditate on your precepts and fix my eyes on your ways. I will delight in your statutes. I will not forget your word. Deal bountifully with your servant that I may live and keep your word. Open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of your law. Along the way, we've been using this seeing, savoring, and and encountering formula to help our engagement with scripture. But I'm gonna do something a little different uh, this morning and, and reverse the order of that, uh, both because I believe that's how our passage presents these things to us, but more than that, I want us to begin with where do we want to land? You know, what, what, what's the end goal? What effect in us do we want to come away with in our engagement with scripture? What do we want to see produced in us over the long haul? And how do we get there? So first, encountering, pursuing a God-affected heart. And there is encounter language all over this text. And maybe as we've talked about that, that's been a little confusing for you. You're not really sure what to expect. You know, does that mean I'm I'm supposed to see God show up in visible form in my bedroom? Am I supposed to look for uh, secret messages in my alphabet cereal or or burned into my breakfast toast? Uh, but, But here he describes things like a way that is pure. In verse 9, an undivided heart that does not wander. In verse 10, a a practice of turning from sin. In verse 11, these are the marks of someone who has met with God. He's come away with uh, insight about his weaknesses and temptations. He has, has a fresh sense of allegiance to God and faith to engage the fight against sin. He has eagerness to live a life that is pleasing to God. This is someone who has been affected. And these things, they've come to him through his experience with God's word. So he says in verse nine, how can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. Verse 11, I've stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. And on he goes for 176 Verses that this is not someone who approaches scripture and comes away unscathed. He doesn't just squeeze in an occasional morning devotion into his day and and move on being driven by the the same anxieties and fleshly concerns as ever. His his interaction with God's word really changes him. Now the psalmist is, is not just describing a relationship with the Bible, that, that like it's a book in and of itself that excites him. It's not ink on a page or maybe pixels on a screen or, or little facts and interesting sentence structures that do this with it for him. Notice how the, the word of God and the God of the word are almost interchangeable here. Something that we uh, introduced to you is, is one of the ways that Hebrew poetry works is it uses something called parallelism. And, and sometimes uh, the second line will restate, or it'll say in a different way or reinforce what was said in the, ver- in the first line. Look at what he says in verse 10. With my whole heart I seek you. And then he says, let me not wander from your commandments. You see that? So, your commandments, in the second line, is, is parallel with you in the first line. These, these are the kinds of things that we want to notice when we read and we'll come to that. Uh, but he doesn't just relate to the words apart from the author. But he also doesn't try to just ignore the words and have some sort of relationship with God apart from what he's revealed. You, you could think of it like this. You know, if, if my wife wrote a note for me in in a card, Uh, the words there would be precious to me because they give me access to her. They they, they help me understand and know her better. But but, but I just skim the card and move on. And that doesn't transfer to affections for her. 
Uh, or even weirder, I'd like get out a dictionary and do these little online searches about some of the phrases that she uses, but, but nothing in me responds to her, then I've entirely missed the point. On the other hand, it wouldn't be loving for me to just kind of toss the card aside and say, look, I, I don't care about what you've written. I just want to know you, baby. Uh, I'd learn something about her real fast, right? Uh, that, that would not be loving at all. So loving God means paying attention to his words and specifically here his commandments. But these are given to provide an encounter with him. And go back to our original question, how does this work to change us. How does sin reign less in our hearts? Well, once again, verse 11. I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. And the verb for storing something up, it, it, it conveys hiding away treasure. It's what you do with something that you see as Valuable. In other words, taking in scripture in order to treasure God in our hearts is what turns us away from sin. This is the expulsive power of a new affection. This is how it works. And one of the most important verses in the Bible that, that show us this is 2 Corinthians 3, 18. This is in your notes. Right? Very essential verse for us to, to learn and to live. Paul writes, and we all with unveiled face beholding the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. And so beholding leads to becoming. Encountering God is what transforms us. And this is because sin is falling short of the glory of God. It's belittling God. It's treating God as something that is common and occasionally useful. Sin is enjoying other things instead of God. But when we see God's glory, this changes us. And why is that? Well, because he really is glorious. I mean, if we just get in touch with that, he becomes what we want. His beauty and his worth become more compelling than the counterfeits that have captured us. And so encountering God is what dislodges the idols from our affections. We join the Apostle Paul in Philippians 3 who, who takes every other perceived gain and, and every promise of prominence and significance and he gladly lays it on the trash heap in order that he might have more of Christ. Christ has become our treasure and so we don't want to sin against him. We, we don't want to trade in the, the joy that we have in him in order to have empty thrills. And notice how, how Paul describes this process of change. He says, we are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. And so, when you encounter him, you don't just see glory. You become more glorious. You become more like God has designed you to be, increasingly restored to the image of Christ. You become whole. You're, you're no longer some sort of half person desperately searching for other people and things in order to fulfill you. We, we become givers instead of takers. We're not driven by a sense of neediness. We don't have to be approval junkies or affirmation addicts. We don't search out comfort and security and refuge in anything that has an expiration date. We, we become sacrificial and generous because we are convinced that we have riches in the Lord. And Paul says this happens more and more as you behold God. You become full and spilling over and you live life as it was meant to be. And I want more and more of this in my life, which means I know I need to encounter him. 
And by the way, you'd get introduced to this if you would do our, our new members class. But, but this is what sits behind our philosophy of ministry. This is why we don't tend to preach uh, self-help sermons about you know, 10 steps to a thriving marriage or how to experience more victory in your life or how to uh, win friends and influence people. And it's not because those are bad things and, and probably we would address several of them along the way, but, but they're not what drives our ministry. They're not at the center the glory of God revealed through his word and experienced by his people is at the center of what we do. That, that, that's what we believe will serve people in the long run. And so that, that's what shapes how we preach and how we structure ministry. We want you to find God to be astonishing and for that to set you apart, to put you out of sync in this world and to launch you for his kingdom. More than just following some nifty list of, uh, you know, a checklist of application points and things to pursue. We, we want you to be someone who has beheld God and been changed. And what makes you sturdy in trials? What gives you courage to continue when life is, is hard and feels unrelenting? Where does confidence come from? Where is there faith to endure and strength to do what's right even when it's hard and doesn't seem to benefit you right away? It becomes from beholding the glory of the Lord. And so the question is, how do we do that? Where do we behold God's glory? Well, look at the context of this verse in 2 Corinthians 3. And again, these are some of the connections we want to see when we read the Bible. Paul's speaking about the Jews who haven't accepted Christ. And he says in 2 Corinthians 3, verse 14, For to this day, when they read the Old Covenant that same veil remains unlifted because only through Christ is it taken away. Yes, to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. He's, he's talking about conversion there. When we turn to Christ, the veil that lies over our eyes is taken away. And, and so we, we see him when we become like what we behold. And that, that happens decisively when we're saved. Christ has become to us our treasure. But in, until heaven, we'll always be fighting to experience more of him and, and bring our hearts in line with what we know is true. But, but notice where this happens, right? The, the veil's taken away. So we, when we read the same things that we previously read and nothing affected us, it didn't strike us as anything of significance. Now we see glory through the pages of scripture, through an encounter with God. And maybe you feel like, I read the Bible and that's not really what happens. Sometimes I just struggle to stay awake in the morning. And, and I want you to know, you, you know, you're not alone in this. I, I feel this from time to time as well. I, it's just stunning to me how quickly other things can capture my attention and be the driving force for me when I'm reading God's word and steal it away. But before we let ourselves off the hook and, and I'll talk about how it's normal for our Bible reading to be mediocre, let's let this disturb us a little bit. Because it is a frightening reality that we can stand before infinite beauty and be unaffected. John Piper puts it like this. He says, all of us know what it is like to read without seeing wondrous things. We have stared at the most glorious things without seeing them as glorious. We have seen marvels without marveling. We have put God's sweet kindness on the tongue of our soul without tasting sweetness. We have seen unspeakable love without feeling loved. We have seen the greatest power and felt no awe. We have seen immeasurable wisdom 
and felt no admiration. We have seen the holiness of wrath and felt no trembling, which means we are seeing without seeing. This is why we must continue to weave the thread of God-dependent prayer into our reading. Show me your glory. And that's how we began this morning, right? God, reveal this to us. We are dependent on you to show up. Otherwise, we remain behind in our blindness. We need the Spirit to make this effective for us. But that doesn't mean that we remain passive in the process. Right? There is something that we can do to help us to behold glory. There's something that we can do to serve toward being affected. And, and that happens through savoring what we read in Scripture. This allows wonderful things to truly be wonderful to us. Commenting on Psalm 119, Timothy and Kathy Keller say, we ought to work the truths of Scripture into our affections until they shape our loves, hopes, and imagination. By the way, loves, hopes, and imagination. That is what you live out of. Right? That, at the end of the day, shapes your expectations. That, that's what drives what you do. More than just what you acknowledge on some level and what is true for you on, on paper. And, and that's why, you know, it is just a powerful thing that the culture around us is able to capture the imagination. If they can win over how you feel, if they can get at your emotions, rather than any argument for why this is the case, they have you. And so we need that to be displaced by something else. And here's how the psalmist puts it in verse 14. In the way of your testimonies, I delight as much as in all riches. How can this be true for us? How can we feel rich in the truth that we have in God? Well, look what he says in verse 15. I will meditate on your precepts and fix my eyes on your ways. One of the reasons why we, we, we come away from the Bible and, and we're not sure we've really met with God is because we skipped this step. This is what Thomas Brooks says. He says, remember that it is not hasty reading but serious meditation on holy and heavenly truths that makes them prove sweet and profitable to the soul. It is not the mere touching of the flower by the bee that gathers honey, but her abiding for a time on the flower that draws out the sweet. It is not he that reads most, but he that meditates most that will prove to be the choicest, sweetest, wisest, and strongest Christian. This is because meditation causes us to actively engage God's word and live out of what is true there. They, they, these things, they, they don't remain merely on paper as something that we give mental assent to while other knowledge and beliefs are what shape us, right? As we described in our Summer Bible Jam field manual, through meditation, what we do, we, we've read a passage and now we allow the passage to read us. We locate our lives in the text, we think carefully about the reality and the significance of what it describes and whether or not we're currently experiencing it. We ask the Spirit to show us what, what in us is competing with our living in the good of this. We actively transfer our trust and our hopes away from the, the, the false saviors and counterfeits that we so often run to and we run toward what God says is true. We, we, we seek a convincing. We, we, we sang this earlier, right? Help my heart believe. I know this. On some level, I believe. Help my unbelief. You do that through meditation. Convictions become instilled in your heart. We want to feel it. We want what is hard in our hearts to become softened and what has grown cold to be warmed in the fire of God's word. And notice what he says in verse 16. I will delight in your statutes. I will not 
forget your word. And listen, it is so easy to forget the most important things. Right, that's probably more true today than ever with half of our brains stored on our iPhone. We, we train our minds over time to not have to remember certain things, certain things that used to be essential in order to just function in society. And so we don't have to remember addresses, phone numbers, uh, directions, recipes, the names of our children, uh, anything that we can just ask Siri and, and she will readily provide that information for us. But, but listen, the, the, the problem here is not mainly cognitive. It's spiritual. Martin Luther, I mean, we're gonna be studying the Reformation in, in the fall because we are, we're coming up on the 500th anniversary of a very significant event that happened in church history in restoring the gospel to God's people. And so we're excited about that series coming up. But something that Martin Luther said, he said, every week... I preach justification by faith because every week they forget it. <laughs> and the problem is, it's not that that's some sort of complicated doctrine. It's relatively simple. But the problem is we, we have this bent to seek out acceptance in other things. We're insecure and so we work really hard to make ourselves look good or to measure up to our comparisons with others and, and anyone who makes us feel less significant, those are the people that we want to stay away from. We don't like them. We become envious of them or jealous. Where's all that coming from? Well, well the fact that I have already been declared to be in the right in Christ that I'm already justified, it has become a whisper in the noise. That's not what's captured my imagination. Somebody else's social media feed has. And uh, their sense of significance and stats. And I, I feel like I need to justify my existence through what I'm doing, whether, whether that's moral goodness or whether that's my particular talents or how put together my family is. I have forgotten, simple, but truths that are our life. And this happens. And meditation helps to fix what we forget. We call truths to mind and make our lives answer to them. And, and this can actually be a useful method for meditation. You know, when you read a passage, ask yourself, what happens to me when I forget that this is true? What, what starts to show up in me and in my attitudes and in my responses when I've forgotten what God has, be, has declared to be true of me? You know, we, we realize the value of what we have when we consider what it would be like if we lost it. And so you, you might not particularly prefer having to show up for your job every day, uh, but what would happen if you're unemployed? Some of you are, are facing that. You, you know what it's like, right? Uh, you, you, you might be tired of parenting, but what if you didn't have your children or whatever category that, that works for you? We, we, we realize the value of these things, how precious they are to us when we see that uh, we wouldn't be able to function without them. And so do that as you savor God's word. You know, what if we didn't have adoption as sons and daughters? then we would lose all confidence to approach God as our loving Father. We would allow our guilt to keep us at a distance from Him. We'd become defined by our shame. We would figure, I guess there's, there's no point in returning to Him and just begin to embrace patterns of sin because the, 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 the picture of, of the prodigal's father racing down the road to embrace him. We know that's a story in the Bible somewhere, but that, that's not what's gripped our imagination and our affections. Right? What if we didn't have the sovereignty of God? Life would be a frightening chaos. We'd be at the whim of our circumstances. Anything could go wrong. Life would be without purpose. We'd feel abandoned in whatever situation that we're in. Or what if we didn't have eternity? 
then we'd be striving to get all of the, the physical comforts and pleasures and money that we can here and now and we would be terrified of death. We would be clinging to all of the stuff that passes through our hands. We would fight for safety at all costs. And we know this. Those are sometimes our functional beliefs. Sometimes that is more compelling to us. And so meditation puts us back in touch with what is true and allows our hearts to overflow with gratitude and affection for God. I just want to encourage you, you know, we, we, we gave out the little field manual booklet uh, to you at the beginning of our Summer Bible Jam. I hope you've stuck that in your Bible. Uh, use that. There's just a lot of little tips and help to, to make this a part of your ongoing process of, of thinking about and considering God's Word. We put resources on, on the website that you can revisit uh, because we, we see how necessary this is. Now, you're only going to get this far if you first read the Bible and understood what it says. You, you, you need to see something first in order to savor it. Otherwise, all you're left with are your own thoughts to ponder. There, there's, there's nothing to replace them. And, and it seems that many Christians today are content with just that. Just basic Bible reading has become inconsistent and thin. And that doesn't necessarily stop us from feeling good about ourselves or or gleaning some sense of inspirational thought for the day. But just because something feels inspiring to us doesn't mean that God has inspired it. You, you realize that, right? It may just be that we have borrowed whatever culturally shaped ideas are around us and, and that is what's framing how we think and we've, we've attached some biblical language to it. It's just really easy to, to baptize the idols that are already in our hearts. That, that's what Satan did when he came to Jesus. He quoted scripture to him. He, he's trying to make this appeal of, of surely this is what God wants from you. And, 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 and if our reading of scripture doesn't ever seek to really pay attention to what is this saying to, to me? What, 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 what is God's intention in this text? Then we are liable to fall to the same temptation. You know, we quote something like Psalm 37.4. Mr. Phil read from Psalm 37 this morning. He didn't, didn't read this, this verse, but maybe it's, it's familiar for you, even if you don't know where, where it's found. But delight yourself in the Lord and what? He will give you the desires of your heart. And that gets thrown around very easily because we've read it at some point or heard somebody else say it. But often we, we don't stop to consider what might delighting myself in the Lord, what, what effect might that actually have on the desires of my heart? Because some, sometimes we think that, that that verse means that God's just ready to endorse whatever we think is gonna make us happy, even if it means he takes the back seat to whatever really reigns in our hearts. Whether or not it's within his will for our lives. God's gonna provide it. And, and we treat it like it's this little formula that if you, if you do the right things and you approach God in the right way, then he'll bless you in this way. And we've, we've never really considered what, what does David mean there and allowed that to dislodge from us what so often has our affections. And so meditation does lead us to ask the question, what does it mean to me? But that's only after we we've, we've first ask the question, what does it mean? Period, right? What has God, through the human author, intended to communicate in this text? In verse 18, he, he asks God to help him see. Uh, he, he says this, Open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of your law. He's praying for God to enable him to recognize what's really there. And, and notice, it's, it's really in the law. He's saying, open up the law to me. I want to I wanna see what's inside of it. I want wondrous things to reach out and find me. But he's not closing his Bible and, and asking the Holy Spirit to reveal some new private meaning about that verse. Right? He, he's saying, I'm, I'm looking here. God, open this book to me. He, he's convinced there's wonders inside and he wants his eyes to be open wide in order to see him. But, but it's, it's interesting. It, it, there, there are two sides of this in this text. I look back up in verse 15. 
He says, I will fix my eyes on your ways. God, you open my eyes and I will fix my eyes right here on your ways. He's praying for insight even as he's paying careful attention to the words of scripture. And these two things need to go together. There was a a famous reply that the old Princeton scholar B.B. Warfield made when when somebody had had, had said the comment, you know, uh, 10 minutes on your knees will give you more knowledge of God than 10 hours over your books. And he said, really? More than 10 hours over your books on your knees? And that's what we've been after in, in this summer Bible jam, right? To be good students of God's word in the presence of God. To, to work hard, to learn how to read this, but to do it dependent on him to show up. The Bible is a book. God has given us a book. We need to learn how to read it. That's what we've sought to help with along the way, introducing different genres and talking about how do you find the main point of a passage and, and different resources that can be used to, to help along the way. But, but if nothing else, the main thing we, we need to be convinced of is that seeing wonderful things in Scripture, it comes from fixing our eyes on the text as we plead with God to open them. And this is challenging to do today because we have all caught ADD. <laughs> And even though there's, there's no pathology for that, apparently that's a contagious disease that we have all, it's, it's, it's a cultural condition. Life trains us to relate to information in this way. And so as, as a people, we are a mile wide and an inch deep. We're more satisfied by knowing a little bit about everything than we are about knowing something of, of substance about anything in particular. And so we're a culture of skimmers. And Pastor Keith has mentioned this before that, you know, as, as, as studies have been done on eye patterns, as, as people read material, it, it, it takes this little F pattern. And so we, we read two lines and then we just kind of skim straight down. And they, they, they just watch people's eyes do that over and over again. I'm not telling you anything new. You know you do this, right? Uh, you know, sometimes I'll, I'll find there's this new interesting article about how uh, the internet's affecting our brains or how our, our devices are I- engaging the way that we interact with content. And, and I'll do a pretty good job of skimming that article and moving on. Um, because I, I, I think social media drives this too. We, we'd rather be able to post something that we, we've kind of read the headings on and said, hey, somebody somewhere should probably pay more attention to this because we more like the thought of having known something than really knowing it. And there are a few things that we've really worked hard to know. And somewhere along the way, we have exempted God's word from that. We have expected that this would become relatively easy for us. I love, love the strings and the piano this morning. I mean, just think of it like somebody who picks up a violin with little to no practice and takes that bow and scratches the strings and, and, then, and then feels like there's, there, there's a problem with this instrument. Something's dysfunctional here, right? It, it takes hours and hours and Gina knows the sounds coming from her home that has produced an ability to play these instruments, Right? Why do we think that the problem is with the Bible or something's wrong with the practice of reading it when we give it five minutes of distracted attention and feel like, you know, reading just doesn't do much for me. Well, reading in that way doesn't do much for anyone. And listen, I, I know this. I know the struggle in me as well. But that sometimes it, 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 it takes... Reading a passage over a course of time, 10 to 15 times, to really see some of what's in there. And there is always more. I mean, will we expect anything less from a divinely inspired book? So we want to learn how to make space to be careful readers, to stare at God's word. I will fix my eyes. You, God, you have my attention. John Piper calls this this concept aggressive attentiveness. 
And he, he talks about uh, this, this one college professor named Jennifer Roberts, and she teaches a course. It's really interesting. It's called The Art of Looking. And she's a, 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 an art professor, and, and so that, that's the play on the words art there. Uh, but what she'll have, she'll, she'll give these assignments uh, to her students, and, and, and sometimes she'll send them out, and you'll say, so, so, okay, here's the painting. I want you to go sit in the museum and look at it for three hours. And this is what she has to say. He says, every external pressure, social and technological, is pushing students in the other direction toward immediacy, rapidity, and spontaneity. I want to give them the permission and the structures to slow down. The first thing I ask them to do in the research process is spend a painfully long time looking at that object. And she says that the amount of time I, I prescribed is, is supposed to seem ridiculous. But he, he, she just describes her own experience. She says it's, it, it's 20 minutes in before I noticed in one particular painting that the shape of, the, of this boy's ear was the identical shape of the outline of this mouse's belly on this particular painting. And she starts to list off different things that 30 minutes in, this is what I saw. An hour in before I even noticed that this is what's taking place and she begins to realize what was the artist intending to communicate to this that is paint on a canvas. This right here, God breathe words. They are worth our attention. They are worth patient, aggressive attentiveness. And the, the encouraging reality as we've seen this morning is that if we give our attention to scripture, if we seek to see wonderful things and we savor what we see so that we encounter God, we really will be changed. New longings will show up. Different motivations than the same self-serving concerns that have defined us for so long. We relate to people out of, not out of this sense of desperation and, and urgency and frustration because we are, we are looking to them or we're looking to some sort of resolution in this circumstance and, and we are frightened. That affects how we speak and how we engage. We are in touch with different things, things that are eternally true. As we look on God's word, as we meditate on it, as we encounter him, we behold glory and we are transformed and this really is possible. We can really grow. Eric, if you come back up, man. So I, I, I know there are many other biblical realities that should inform our expectations here for how the process of sanctification takes place in someone's life and the reality of sin that still dwells in us. But listen, if, if, if you just are honest with yourself and honest before the Lord and, and, and you know there are certain things that have characterized you for a long time. Addictive behaviors. Certain things that you have gone to for pleasure over and over again. And you find yourself wondering, why, why have I done something so stupid? Until you show up at the same location one more time. Right, if, you, if you are plagued by things like, I think the Lord awakened in me last night as I was praying through this. Specifically things like anger and anxiety. It, it might be because you, you don't really understand yourself. You, you, you haven't taken the time to explore with God. What, what is leading to that? You know at some level, I, I'm, I'm not supposed to be anxious. Or I'm not supposed to yell at my family. I'm not supposed to erupt like that at, at work. Things, things shouldn't cause that kind of reaction in me, but, but you, you, you haven't listened to what, what is reigning inside of you that is leading you to do that. You don't really understand yourself. But even more importantly than that, might it be 
You've never given God's word the kind of patience, the kind of availability of your soul, the kind of savoring that we've described today that allows you to see God's glory in a way that really will change you. This, this struggle, we will, be, we will be involved in this process for the, every day of the rest of our life until we are in heaven and there will be no more struggle. And everything inside of us is resolved with God, how God has made us to be. But there should be progress that we are seeing. There, there, there should be the kinds of things that Psalm 119 describes. I'm turning away from sin. I've got affection and hope for you, God. You are my delight. I'm not driven by the same issues and concerns that have always gripped me. You just allow God to do a work of revealing that in, in your heart. Is it because he has said, hey, there's, there, there's a medicine here that's gonna fix this in you. And you've been too busy to take the medicine You've been taking other things instead. You've turned aside from it. I mean, if somebody were doing that with just something that had to do with physical health, we would think they are retarded. But for some reason, we, we excuse ourselves from the very process that God has designed to free us, to show us glory and make us glorious. So I want us to stand together and as we conclude our time in this series, I pray for God's favor on all of us in a way that sends us forth to allow this to continue, to make room for it in our day-to-day -day lives and for these to be moments when God is pleased to show up and powerfully reveal himself through his word. Let's pray. Oh God, we feel something of what the author of this psalm described when he said, open my eyes that I might see wondrous things in your law. Lord, we know too often we don't see. Too often we're distracted. Too often our Bibles remain closed and left behind. Too often we, we might sit down and your word is open, but our heart is not open to it. We don't have the patience and the honesty that allows your spirit to use your word to read us, to show us ourselves, and then to show us Christ. God, thank you that that doesn't have to be the continuing storyline. As we've heard this morning, real change is possible. It's true in all the dimensions of our life. That's true in our Bible reading and our prayer and our times of encountering you. Lord, Lord, the, 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 this does not have to be inevitable. Lack of desire, lack of engagement, that does not have to characterize us, God. You're the kind of God who redeems and restores and changes and turns things around. So God, we are leaning into you. We ask that you would send your spirit upon us in a reviving way. But certainly we want, we want to see you show up in the significant needs and extraordinary places of life. But Lord, in just this day-to-day -day ordinary thing that you have designed but that requires everything about it to be supernatural. God, meet with us. Fulfill your promise to draw near to us as we draw near to you. And God, would you redefine for us what drawing near looks like? Lord, we, we know what it's like to pursue certain things, 
to be diligent, to be eager, to, to make sure that they take place, to make sure they show up on our schedules. Or as we sang earlier, where else will we go? You alone have the words of life. There's no other information, there's no other knowledge, there's nothing else that could compel us or grip our imagination that has the ability to give us life, to set us free. And that we know it as your people, even as those who have been set free, that we need increasing freedom. God, I pray for favor. Lord, if, if there is in us a realization that certain cravings and desires of the flesh have, have been at the center of what we are living out of for so long. God, grant us encouragement. But we see that it doesn't have to stay the same but faith to pursue your ordained means for us to behold the glory and become like what we behold. Oh, help us, Lord. I want to close by singing.
Lord, solidify the work that you've done in our hearts this summer and continue the work of knowing you in your word, of seeing you rightly, of letting your word expose and correct and convict and instruct and encourage and exhort us and to build our faith upon you, God. We need you, Lord. And we have you, Lord, which is good. It's good news to us, Lord. May we go this week out into the world, into our responsibilities with our Savior Jesus and the power of your Spirit. Lord, be glorified in us, we pray. Amen. Amen. You guys have a great week.